My fellow Sazaitas, allow me to show you a picture of uh, Kamuzu Banda, Kenneth Kaunda and Joshua Nkomo. The three leaders of liberation movements in Zimbabwe, Zambia and Malawi at a time when these three countries were in a federation. You see, these three leaders traveled extensively across the globe canvassing support for the liberation of their respective countries. The end of the federation in December 1963 paved way for the independence of Zambia and Malawi. That means Kamuzu Banda and Kaunda made it. They came to power in 1964, but Joshua Nkomo didn't make it. In fact, his political party split four months before the end of the federation. And this created a new party called ZANU, the political platform upon which Robert Mugabe rose to power in 1980 when Zimbabwe got independent. But how did this happen? Why and how did Joshua Nkomo leave it up to Robert Mugabe? How did ZANU overtake ZAPU? In fact, why did ZAPU split in the first place? And if Zambia and Malawi got independent in 1964, what took the Zimbabwean independence so long? Well, fellow Sazaitas, slay queens and bingers, socialites, Papa lights, Vasnama lights, Varukujga rice, Nevasnama rights. Welcome to the special report. When we talk about the liberation of Zimbabwe, the name that quickly comes to mind is that of Robert Mugabe. Well, of course, Robert Mugabe played a very pivotal role in liberating Zimbabwe, but his glorification is often done at the expense of the founding leaders of the Zimbabwean liberation struggle. Many often forget that Robert Mugabe officially became president of ZANU in 1977, three years before the independence of Zimbabwe and 14 years after the formation of ZANU. Again, I am by no means trying to discredit the incredible contribution of Robert Mugabe in liberating Zimbabwe. I am simply, well, setting the record straight, putting things in context. Anyway, enough said about Robert Mugabe. This is the story of Umdalawet, the story of Chibwechiteza, the story of Father Zimbabwe. Joshua Mkabugo Ganyongo Longomo, the founding leader of Zimbabwean liberation movements. Joshua Nkomo was born on the 19th of June in 1917, one year before the birth of Nelson Mandela and six years before the formation of Southern Rhodesia's first responsible government. Remember that from 1923 to 1964, Zimbabwe was known as Southern Rhodesia and after Zambia's independence in 1964, Southern Rhodesia changed its name to Rhodesia because Northern Rhodesia was no more. So they thought it no longer made sense to call it Southern Rhodesia. After all, how can there be a South without a North? So, Joshua Nkomo was born at 27 years after the colonization of Zimbabwe. But if you're a geek like me and you want to be technical about it, I guess you could say Nkomo was born at 27 years after the colonization of the land north of the Limpopo and south of the Zambezi. When Nkomo was born, Lopengula had been dead for only 23 years and Mbuya Nehanda had been dead for only 19 years. I am just trying to make you understand why they called him Umdalawetu, translated our old men. Anyway, Nkomo was born in Semokwe in Mataveleland. He was born in a family of eight, with him being the third born, and just like most African families, Nkomo's family didn't have much. He did his primary education in Cholocho, and shortly afterwards, he did a carpentry course and a driving. He later moved to South Africa for his secondary education where he met his destiny helper, a lady called Mrs. Hoskins. 
By this time, Nkomo was in his mid-twenties. You see, what actually happened is that after completing primary school, Nkomo didn't have money to further his education. So what he did is, upon completing primary education, he did a carpentry course and also learned how to drive. Afterwards, he got a job as a delivery boy for a local bakery in Ulawayo. He also did some carpentry in Kezi. By 1941, he had raised enough money for one year of secondary education. He used this money to enroll at Adams College in South Africa where he did his secondary education. But like I said, this money was only enough for one year. He only completed his secondary education in South Africa uh, through the help of a lady called uh, Mrs. Hoskins. She was a clerk at Adams College. She also paid uh, his uh, tertiary tuition in Johannesburg, where he met various uh, ANC cadres who inculcated in him the spirit of uh, nationalism. These were the formative years of Joshua Nkomo's political career. Nkomo returned to southern Rhodesia in 1947 and got a job at Rhodesia Railways as a social worker. He was the first black person to be given such a post. As a social worker, he worked very closely with the African staff and soon became very popular amongst them. This led to his appointment as secretary of the Railway Workers Association in 1951. This position was a stepping stone to the much bigger role he would soon play in national politics. At this point, there wasn't any vibrant national political party that represented black opinion in southern Rhodesia. This was an era of trade unions which saw the rise of the likes of Benjamin Vurombo, Masochandlovu and Nkomo himself. The only notable political party during this period was the Vulaoyo-based ANC, which though initially it enjoyed considerable support in Mashonaland, it was by this time largely a regional party with its activities confined in and around Vulawayo. In 1952, Joshua Nkom was elected president of this ANC party and immediately started working on reviving it with a view to giving it national appeal. His activities did gain traction, however, his party failed to gain national prominence, though he did get invited by the Prime Minister of Southern Rhodesia at the time, Edgar Whitehead, to participate in the deliberations on the formation of the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Joshua Nkomo was amongst the many Africans who opposed the idea of a federation. However, this opposition was disregarded by the whites. The formation of this uh, federation in 1963 established a federal parliament, the Parliament of the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasaland. And in 1954, Nkomo ran as an independent candidate for a seat in this uh, federal parliament. However, he lost uh, to a guy called Mike Hove. But the fact that uh, Joshua Nkomo ran as an independent candidate tells you that, nationally speaking, his party, the ANC, didn't have a political capital. The following year, rising nationalists in Harare, the likes of uh, James Chikerema, George Nyandoro, Edson Sitole, created a new party called the City Youth League. However, just like the ANC, it failed to garner national support. Just the name itself uh, tells you the whole story, City Youth League. Afterwards, Joshua Nkomo started conversing with the leadership of the City Youth League on the possibility of uniting the two parties in order to create one broad-based national movement. Consequently, in 1957, these two parties finally merged into one and they decided to go with the name ANC and it became the first fully-fledged Zimbabwean National Liberation Movement. Nkomo was elected a president. The merging of the ANC and the City Youth League in 1957 proved very effective because the ANC soon became a pain in the Ningirikini to the authorities. In 1959, 500 members of the ANC got arrested. The ANC got banned a few months after. 
Fortunately for Nkomo, when all of this happened, he was outside the country on party business. The ANC was reconstituted as the National Democratic Party, the NDP, in January 1960, and Michael Mawema was appointed caretaker president in the absence of Joshua Nkomo. The first Congress of the NDP was held in September 1960, and many people challenged Joshua Nkomo for the presidency. These included Ndabaningi Stole, Leopold Takawira, Moton Malianga, and the caretaker president, Michael Mawema. In the end, Nkomo was elected president, and in 1961, he was invited to a constitutional conference by the Southern Rhodesia Prime Minister at the time, Edgar Whitehead. Nkomo was accompanied to this uh, conference by Chitepo, Sitole, and George Slindiga. This all stakeholders conference drafted a new constitution for Southern Rhodesia. The main demand for the NDP during this conference was the principle of one man, one vote. But this demand was sharply rejected by the whites. In the end, Joshua Nkomo and the NDP delegates that attended the conference agreed to the final draft. However, the NDP members that didn't attend the conference rejected the draft in its entirety, much to the annoyance of Nkomo, who fiercely defended his position in accepting the final draft. This issue presented an existential crisis for the NDP. <laughs> the party actually split. You see, Michael Mawema, who had been caretaker president of the NDP at its formation when Nkomo was outside the country, left the NDP together with guys like um, Paul Mushonga and uh, Patrick Matimba. They created a new party called the Zimbabwe National Party. But of course, it flopped. But why were these guys clashing over the 1961 draft constitution? Well. Nkomo felt that, though he didn't like many aspects of this constitution, he felt it was a good start considering where they were coming from. You see, for the first time, this constitution contained a progressive bill of rights which guaranteed the freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of association, and freedom of assembly, regardless of your race, color, or creed. This constitution, however, had a discriminatory voting system. Whites, who were less than 200,000, were given 50 seats in parliament, and blacks, who were more than 5 million, were given only 15 seats in parliament. Furthermore, you had to reach a certain income and education threshold in order to be eligible to vote under this system. So, that is what informed the resistance of most NDP members. Leopold Takawira was amongst the most vocal critics of this constitution, calling it diabolical and treacherous. In the end, Joshua Nkomo buckled down to pressure from his NDP colleagues and formally rejected the 1961 constitution. In explaining his change of attitude, he remarked that, a leader is he who expresses the wishes of his followers. No sane leader can disregard the voice of his people and supporters. Those are the words of Joshua Nkomo. However, the NDP was banned in December 1961. A week later, Zapo was formed with Nkomo as its president. But less than a year later, in September 1962, Zapu was banned. The banning of Zapu escalated the tensions that had been growing in Zapu for years. Many leaders in Zapu had grown increasingly frustrated with Nkomo's leadership. Some felt that Nkomo had become too accustomed to the luxuries of international travel and was therefore unwilling to suffer personal hardship like others. But Nkomo refuted these allegations, saying that his various international trips had actually put the Rhodesian issue on the map. You see, at this point, Zapu effectively had uh, two factions. One faction loyal to Nkomo and the other loyal to the national chairman of Zapu, 
Ndabaningi stole. One issue that soon became a bone of contention in this factional fight was Nkomo's decision to form a government in exile after Zapu got banned. Stolle's faction believed that the way forward was the creation of a new party to replace the banned Zapu and to take a policy of confrontation. But Nkomo fiercely opposed this. He argued that creating a new political party was not going to help with anything because it was going to get banned anyway. He strongly believed that a government in exile was the best way forward. You see, realizing that the Rhodesian Front, which was the ruling party in southern Rhodesia at the time, would soon cut ties with the British government via UDI, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence, Nkomo believed that a nationalist government in exile would compete with the white settler regime for international recognition and given that the British were now willing to grant independence to Zimbabwe, Zambia and Malawi, he felt that this was a viable option. But the Stolle faction would have none of it. They wanted a radical approach. They believed that militancy was the way forward. Their position was uh, further strengthened by uh, President Julius Nyerere of Tanzania who rebuked Joshua Nkomo for his idea of a government in exile. This Tole faction believed now more than ever that Joshua Nkomo had to be gotten rid of. And so, they convened a national executive meeting and voted to remove Nkomo as president of Zapu and replaced him with uh, Ndavanege Stole. When Gomo found out because he did not attend the meeting, and so did many of his uh, well trusted lieutenants, those who still believed in his leadership, when he found out, he suspended all of them, calling them rebels. Ironically, this is exactly what happened in 2013 when the MDC split for the second time. See, nothing is new in Zimbabwe. The suspended rebels gathered at uh, Anderson Kala's house on the 8th of August 1963 in Highfields and they formed a new party called ZANU led by uh, Ndabaningi uh, This is the party that went on to rule Zimbabwe from 1980 when Zimbabwe got its independence. Uh, this party, ZANU, has been in power uh, since that day. Of course, I also need to explain how ZANU overtook Nkomo's party, ZAPU, and how ZAPU got swallowed by ZANU in 1987. There is also another very important aspect of tribalism which I also need to explain because ZANU was always a Shona party. When you look at its executive, the only non-Shona person was Eno Sinkal. Interestingly, if not revealingly, Eno Sinkala never made it to the presidium of ZANU, despite the fact that ZANU was formed in his house on the 8th of August 1963. On the other hand, uh, take a look at the ZAPO executive after the split. The vice president was uh, James Chikerema, a Shona, and uh, the secretary general was George Nyandoro, another Shona. Uh, this practice uh, continued until 1987 with Shona guys like Chinamano and Musika becoming vice presidents in succession. ZANU on the other hand was almost exclusively a Shona party with the exception of its uh, treasurer general Eno Sinkala. In fact, uh, Joshua Nkom was the first non-Shona person to get into the ZANU PF presidium. And this, of course, was necessitated by the 1987 Unity Accord. Uh, the politics of the liberation struggle are very complicated because there was just so many factors involved. One can be simplistic in one's uh, analysis of events. But uh, this video was not an analysis. I was not analyzing anything. I was simply telling the story of Father Zimbabwe. But his story can't be told in one episode. There's just so much to tell. This was just an introduction. As always, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoy the content, please like and share.